In this video I'm going to look at analysis of variance and try and explain where the numbers come from and how they help us test hypotheses about means. The example I'm going to use is illustrated here and it comes from my own honours work on the Waratara anemone. anemone. It's an animal that lives in intertidal regions around um, temperate Australia. So it occupies most regions through the rocky shores except areas where there's large fleshy macroalgae. So for some reason it doesn't survive there particularly well. Perhaps it simply can't attach successfully. To test these ideas I did a simple study and what I did was to create three treatments. One treatment was just patches of macroalgae that were just marked out so I could keep track of them. Then there were patches of bare rock. Now bare rock in the intertidal region is generally not actually bare. That's why I've coloured it green. It's usually covered with a thin layer of microalgae, diatoms and blue-green algae. And then finally I created bare rock by scrubbing the seashore sea floor as you can see in this rather blurry image down here and two of these are from long ago and very small originals. So as you can see I've got three treatments set up with three replicates of each and into each of these plots I put 15 anemones to start with. Now this is an example of a scrub plot. The actual plots used for this experiment were larger. So let's go to the data. And up in the table at the top here I've got the number of animal, animals remaining in each treatment after about six weeks. So for the macroalgae it was 1, 4 and 5 out of 15. For the no algae it was 15, 9 and 12. And so on those results it looks very much as if the macroalgal situation is unfavourable to the animals but the other two situations are fairly comparable. As well as calculating the averages, I've also calculated the variances. And then down the bottom here I've got the standard one factor analysis of variance summary table. And as you will be aware there are three sources of variation that we can identify here. Among, that is among the groups or between the three experimental treatments, within the groups and then the total. So what I'm going to do now is look at where these three sums of squares come from. So let's start with total. And if I go over here in this table where I'm working out the total sums of squares, you'll see I've got it down here is 206. And we'll look at this first entry. And in the formula bar it is D3, which is this cell here. Take away O11, which is this one here. And then square that. So 1 minus 9 gives us 8, squared is 64. The next one, we move on to the next cell, the 4. 4 take away 9 is 5, squared is 25. And then the last one in this group, 5 take away 9 is 4, negative 4. And squared gives us 16. So I just do that for every treatment and then total them up and get the grand total of those numbers, 206. And that is the total sum of squares. Down here is the formula describing how that is done. And simply we take each individual value, each observation, subtract the grand mean, and when there's a dot in the formula it means we've taken the average over that. So I've taken average over all replicates and all treatments square those values. Because we're taking each individual observation and the grand mean, we're getting rid of, we're ignoring the grouping. So we're ignoring which treatment the observation comes from because every observation is compared to the overall mean, which is 9 for this set of data. So that's the total. Okay, what about the within? Well, over this table, 
I've got the within sum of squares. So what's going on here? All right, click in here, and it's d3. So again, I start with the observation. Take away g3, which is the mean for that treatment, and again, square the result. So this is easier to calculate if we look at the bottom row down here. We've got 15 is the first observation, 12 is the mean, so 15 take away 12 is 3 squared is 9. 9 take away 12 is negative 3 squared is 9 again. And then the last entry is 0 because the observation is equal to the mean for the group. So again, up here, each observation, subtract the mean for the group and square the result. So I've got those numbers for each group and then I add them up. 61.33 is the within groups sum of squares or error or residual as it's sometimes referred to. So that's two of them accounted for and they make sense if we look here at the definitional formula. In the first one I compare an observation. Incidentally that should not have a bar over it. I've just recognized there's an error there. It should just be xij. For the within we compare every individual observation to the mean for the group. And I've noticed again that's got a bar over it and it shouldn't have. So this should just be xij minus x bar i dot and this one should be x bar ij minus x bar dot dot. What about the, the last one, the among? Okay, I've got among up here and what's going on here? g3 so that's the mean for the macroalgal group. Take away G7, which is the overall mean, the grand mean, and square the outcome. And do that again for microalgae and for no algae. And here we can see easily what's going on. Uh, the mean for the no algae is 12 take away the grand mean of 9, we get 3 squared is 9, and add those up, it's 48.22. Hang on. The among down is 144.67, and up here I've got 48.22. In fact, what I need to do is multiply the 48.22 by the number of replicates. In other words, I multiply it by 3. And the reason I do that is this only three numbers are being used for the sum of squares among, whereas the other two calculations use all of the replicates but in different ways. So by multiplying 3, I ensure that all the sums of squares are worked out effectively using nine numbers. OK. So that's up here, the sum of squares among the mean for the group, take away the grand mean squared and multiply by the number of replicates. Now, as you will be aware if you know anything about analysis of variance, the next step is to calculate degrees of freedom. For the among, it's simply the number of groups, take away one, so three minus one is two. For the win, within, it's the number of groups times the degrees of freedom for each group. So each group has three replicates, which gives two degrees of freedom. Multiply that by k equals three groups, and we get six degrees of freedom. And the total degrees of freedom is the total number of observations take away one. Nine minus one, eight. So we divide sums of squares by degrees of freedom to get mean squares, and that gives us mean square among 72.33 and within 10.22. Dividing 72.33 by 10.22 gives us 7.08. And we can look at the tables or get the p-value. It's less than 0 0.05, so we're going to reject the null hypothesis. Why does the comparison of the among groups mean square with the within groups mean square test the null hypothesis? I'm glad you asked. There is theory underlying the analysis of variance and that theory shows that the within mean square 
is an estimate of simply within groups variance. It's actually a pooled or average estimate of within group variance. So it's just measuring the variability within each of the experimental treatments. And for analysis of variance, we're assuming that all the groups or treatments have the same within variability. In other words, we assume that all the variances are equal. As it turns out, that's not a critical assumption and analysis of variance is very robust to violations of that assumption, but I'm not going to look at that anymore here. The among mean square is an estimate of the sum of two things. One of those again is within groups mean square. One of those again is within groups variation or residual or error. But the among mean square has added to it n times the sum of treatment effects. And the treatment effect is simply the difference between the group mean and the overall mean. Think about that again. It's the difference between the group mean and the overall mean. That by definition is the treatment effect. Now what happens when we divide the among mean square by the within mean square? In the case of this analysis we get a number of about 7 and we reject the null hypothesis. What is that saying? That's saying that the sum of treatment effects is significantly different from zero. Imagine what would happen if there were no treatment effects. Imagine if this term here is equal to zero, then I'm dividing one estimate of within group variation by another estimate of within group variation and the F ratio should be about one. And in fact for simulations where there is no treatment effect going on, the F ratio will vary around 1, sometimes being a bit below, sometimes being a bit above. So what I'm actually testing for when I do the analysis of variance and calculate the F ratio is the presence of treatment effects. And treatment effects indicate that the mean of a group, that mean of at least one group, is different from the other groups. If it isn't, if all means are equal, then we can't have treatment effects. Let's look just a little bit further. I said within groups is an estimate of average within group variation or variance. You can see it's 10.22. Here it is, 10.22. And what happens when we take the variances and average them? 10.22. Within group variance, within group mean square is actually average variance. Now, a couple of qualifying remarks. The Everything calculates out simply like this in the case where there is a balanced design. If there's not a balanced design, then the within groups mean square will end up being a weighted average of the individual variances. Also, if the design is unbalanced, some other calculations, especially in multi-factor analyses become much more difficult. But hopefully that gives you some idea of where the numbers are coming from and why they actually end up testing the hypothesis we're interested in. That means of all groups are equal.